All right, 1 Timothy chapter 5. Turn there in your Bible. We're going to continue our expository study in the book of 1 Timothy. And uh, I hope you've been watching the different studies because there are a lot of verses in the later parts of these chapters which tie back to earlier chapters. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. Okay, this verse is not a proof text for the man of God being infallible. Okay, and this is also, it, does, it says, entreat him as a father. It does not say call him father. All right, don't give a special title like the Catholics do to their pervert priests. No, you're not supposed to give titles to men like that, okay? And I, I don't even like the title pastor, you know, just call me Brian or whatever. Um, but the whole thing is, you're not to rebuke an elder. Okay, that's very important to remember that. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5 says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resist, resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Let me switch notes here real quick. That was the end of the page there, but uh, the fact of the matter is you are supposed to um, be submissive to people that are older than you. Okay, You need to respect somebody who has more years of experience than you do. Um, when you have somebody who's young and very um, brash with their words and they don't really think much before they just rebuke elderly people, bad situation. You need to respect people that are older. Now, as we read in the last study, 1 Timothy chapter 4, it says that uh, let no man despise thy youth. So just because somebody's older than you doesn't necessarily mean that everything they say is right. There are people that are older, but they've been trained the wrong way. But you need to come to them with, a, with respect. I mean, you're supposed to, everybody's supposed to be subject one to another, so that doesn't mean you can be disrespectful to younger people. Right? But it's extremely important there that when you have a man that's an elder, in the context there, it's talking about a man who's a preacher, like an elder, a one of the leaders in a local assembly there. Um, when you have somebody like that, a group of Christians that's gotten together, and you have a man who's been there and done that, as they say, uh, you need to be real careful how you speak to him. All right. Uh, verse 2. You say, well, that's just to the men, right? Nope. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 2. The elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. You know, it really helps out with lust when you view other Christian women as your sister. And when you view older Christian women as your mother. You know, and if you have been messing around with pornography for years and years and years, pornography teaches you to mentally undress people, women and men, you know, depending on which one you're looking at. Um, but if you're starting to look at people and you're starting to say, that's my sister in Christ, that's like a mother to me, this woman here, that's going to help with that lust problem. Sorry about that. The stink bugs are real bad right now. You're probably going to see me waving my hand around. But um, Titus chapter 2. Turn your Bible to Titus chapter 2. And we're going to see the thing here about uh, elderly people that are older than you and your proper uh, actions towards them. Titus chapter 2, verse 1 through 5 says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise. Thing just went in my pocket. Um, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So you see a bunch of things there, very important things. Older Christians have an extreme responsibility to live by example to the younger Christians. And if you're an older Christian, you know, that's one of the things that makes me so sick about this modern professing Christian church. The older people are encouraged to act like demented teenagers. You see people that are older, older women that should be in a nice dress, you know, and they walk into these modern day phallus houses and they got like skimpy clothes on or something. I'm going, don't you know any better? 
Where's, your, where's the, the honor and the respect that you're supposed to have for yourself, for your age? Okay? That's not a, a, a dishonorable thing. American culture has very much taken away the Bible um, standard there that an older woman or an older man is actually a position of honor and respect. This country worships the youth. They worship young people. You know, kind of like Adolf Hitler did with his Nazi youth movement. Going to be bringing out some stuff on that in the future, but you know, the, the whole point is the aged people are the ones who are going to have the wisdom. They're the ones who should be esteemed highly within a group of Christians, a church. All right, that's very important. And if you have people that are not respecting the elderly, you have a problem. And if you're in a congregation someplace where the elderly are put down, or they say, we don't want, you know, we got to get the young people in here. Uh, that's a place I'd get away from quickly. Turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. Okay, it says here, Honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Um, how do we get to the point where we have nursing homes now? Oh, you see, because the old people are not respected in this society. You take the old people and you get them out of the way. See? And you know, I, I realize I'm not going to bring in some kind of a new reformation here where we can get rid of all nursing homes and we can bring things back to the Bible system. I, I know that. It's, it, this country, America, is too far gone at this point. I understand that there's a whole plethora of new diseases and problems and things like that, health problems that require elderly people to be on machines and on all this other stuff. I know that we're in a rotten mess right now. But this is not the system that God set up. This is not it. And what these retirement homes are doing, what these nursing homes are doing is, they are set up specifically to steal the people's money that go into them. I mean, my grandmother went to one of these places, and again, whole situation there, I won't get into it, but she went to one, and they're charging like, I think it was like $6,000 a month for this. And it's this dinky little room someplace. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, basically a, a one, maybe one and a half rooms in a bathroom, and that costs you $6,000 a month for that? That's nonsense. Absolute nonsense. What's going on there? They are robbing the old people. The elderly of this nation are being robbed. All right? There's not much more that's, that's more wicked other than maybe a faith healer, um, than a lot of these retirement homes. They're putting people in there and they're keeping them alive on machines and, you know, they got one IV into the arm and the other IV into their pocketbook. And they siphon out that money and siphon out that money. I knew of one guy I used to know that uh, his wife worked for this, you know, pharmacist guy and he talked about how his mother was in a home. She ran out of money and they called the guy up on the phone and said, your mom's out of money, come get her. And I know there's nightmare stories out there. I know that there are. Um, if you've ever had a loved one in one of these nursing homes, unless they're absolutely rich, if your loved one is very, very wealthy, then they probably had a good time. But if you don't have much money and you go to a nursing home, it's miserable. You can tell all kinds of nightmare stories. I'm sure some of you know some out there. But the whole point is there, it says there about if you have children or if a widow have children or nephews, they are to show piety at home and to requite their parents. For that is good and acceptable before God. Hmm. Well, that's changed. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 5. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. What's the word supplication mean? Well, if you look it up in Webster's 1828 dictionary, it says, Entreaty, humble and earnest prayer and worship in all our supplications to the Father of mercies, let us remember a world lying in ignorance and wickedness. Definition number two, petition, earnest request. 
Number three, in Roman antiquity, a religious solemnity observed in consequence of some military success. It consisted in sacrifices, feasting, offering thanks, and praying for a continuance of success. A needy widow is oftentimes uh, very godly because she has major needs. Okay? That's not Webster's Dictionary. That's me right in there. But um, the fact of the matter is you get a, a, a godly widow and she's got all kinds of things that she needs done and she needs help with, a lot of times that type of a woman will be very spiritual because she spends a lot of time in um, supplications and prayers night and day. She does a lot of praying. Okay, So that's the first type of a widow. What about the second type of a widow? Look at verse 6. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth, and these things give in charge that they may be blameless. So you have two types of widows. The one there, for whatever reason, she doesn't have a lot of money. Okay? And so she's praying like crazy, and Lord, I need help here, and I don't I can't do this and I can't do that. You know, and, and so she's got problems. And she needs to be taken care of. The other one, her husband was very wealthy, I guess, and, and she's got all kinds of money to live on. And what does she do with that money? Well, she lives in pleasure. She you know, goes vacationing and resorting and all this other stuff like that. And you have these two different types of people here in that church. That's a problem. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verses 13 through 15 says, For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality, as it is written. He that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. So you see, the, what would be the appropriate thing there is for the, the widow who is wealthy and living in pleasure, she should give some of that money to, if this, you know, we'll see here the care of widows here as we continue, but if this poor widow has no one to take care of her, that rich widow should do something to help her out. Okay, there should be equality among the body of Christ. You shouldn't have these huge differences where you have, you have one that's a multimillionaire and the other one doesn't even make $10,000 a year or something. See, that's a problem when you have the body of Christ getting out of whack like that. Kind of like these big mega churches today where you have the pastor up there in the pulpit and he's making 120000 a year and he's asking for money from the guy down in the, you know, pew or chairs now they don't even have pews in a lot of these big mega places but the guy down there is unemployed looking for work and the 120,000 you know six figure salary guy up there in the pulpit is asking him for money and begging him for money and saying if we don't have money from you this church of God is going to be shut down mm -hmm. First Timothy chapter 5 verse 8 okay now we're going to see about this thing of caring for widows. You say, oh, then the, the church can, you know, take care of, of my widowed uh, mother or grandmother or aunt or something like that. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Okay, now in context, this is speaking of the care of widows, but it also extends to every member of the family. Okay, if you are a man and you have children, you know, you're supposed to take care of them. And that's not just financial either, by the way. There's also the issue of safety. Um, spiritually, you're also supposed to take care of them. So you can't duck that thing and try to get out of that and say, you know, well, I'll let somebody else take care of my, you know, widowed, you know, mother or, or aunt or grandmother or something like that. If they are in your household, you take care of them first. Now, if that widow doesn't have anybody... Then let's see what happens here. Verse 9, 1 Timothy 5, verses 9 and 10. Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. So how old is a widow supposed to be before the church takes responsibility for her? Seventy. Okay, under, I'm sorry, let it not a widow be taken under the three, I said, I was thinking three score and ten, thinking of another verse. I made a mistake again. 
I was really trying for infallibility this month. You know, <laughs> sorry, just being sarcastic. But um, three score years old, okay? 60, a score is 20, so you have three scores is, you know, 20 times three is 60. So she has to be 60 years old, at least, there, and been the, the wife of one husband. There again, you've got to watch out for that, because I've known of widows, I've known of widows that have, uh, that basically just go around from older single man to older single man. They just marry, and they get the inheritance when the guy dies, and then they go off and they marry another one, and they get the money from him when he dies, and then they go off and they get married, and they, you know, watch out for that. Watch out for these, these widows that, that go around marrying older, widowed men. Watch out for that. That's not what it's talking about here. This woman here, she's at least 60 years old, been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works. Okay. Now, what happens here, and I'm going to get into this just as a little bit as we continue here. What happens here is some people will take a certain part of this verse, and they'll try to make it an ordinance for Christians today. That's not what's going on here. Okay, Paul's not saying that she must, number one, have brought up children. Number two, she must have lodged strangers. Number three, she must have washed the saints' feet. She must have relieved the afflicted and diligently followed every good work. She has to have those five qualifications. No, Paul just simply says, well reported of for good works. And then he lists a couple good works. Okay? You see, there's a lot of denominations out there, the Mammonites, oh, excuse me, I mean Mennonites, um, and they do this thing of washing the saints' feet. And they say this is an ordinance, just like baptism or communion or things like that. And they'll actually have the men wash the men's feet and the women wash the women's feet. And, you know, they say, well, that's, that's done here in the Bible, so we have to do it today. Uh, well, there's just one problem with that. Um, it only appears one time in the Pauline epistles, and it's right there. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 10. Now, if it was a requirement that all Christians are supposed to be doing this thing, like baptism or communion, well, you know, wouldn't it be written about more than that? And see, what was the deal with washing the saints' feet? Well, back then they wore sandals. And they were in an area where there was a lot of kind of a desert area. It was very dry, very dusty. So washing your feet was something that was a normal, very important thing. Okay, um, it was just something that was there. Uh, most of us don't live in an area where we need our feet washed every day. Okay, um, because of dust and things like that. Now, you know, there's health issues there and stuff. You need to make sure you're clean. But the point is, it's not the same thing. All right, and there are other good works that a Christian widow can do today that are not in that list. All right, there are, there are different things there you might get a Christian widow that sews something for somebody. You know, she's very good with her hands. She can make things with her hands and give them to people and things like that. She's, she does a lot of good works. So don't fall for this thing of you have to wash the saints' feet. It's a Christian ordinance. No, it is not. That's not true. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. But the younger widows, the ones that are under 60... The younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. Now, if you remember from the last study, this word faith does not mean here that this woman, she's damned because she lost her salvation. That's not what it means. It means her first faith there is the faith of Christianity. And that the practices of a Bible-believing Christian, you can get somebody who's saved, and later on in life, they cast that off, and what's it lead to? It leads to the destruction of their life. They have not saved themselves from trouble. They cast off their first faith, and they receive damnation. Their life is made like a living hell, you might say, here on this earth. Why? Because they cast off their first faith. They do not follow the Bible anymore. doesn't mean that they lost their salvation. Got to get that thing down. But what's the word wanton? She will begin to wax wanton. What does that mean? Wanton. I'm just going to read a couple of the definitions. There's a whole bunch in Webster's 1828 Dictionary. But we'll just read a few. Number one, wandering or roving in gaiety or sport. Hmm. 
sportive, frolicsome, darting aside or one way and the other. Wonton boys kill flies for sport. Definition number three. Wandering from, from moral rectitude, licentious, dissolute, indulging in sensuality without restraint, as men groaned wanton by prosperity. Definition number four. More appropriately, deviate, deviating from the rules of chastity, lewd, lustful, lascivious, libidinous. Okay. Uh, definition number six. Loose, unrestrained, running to excess. All right, so you get some... Christian woman and she was a good woman and she's married to a good guy and everything else the man dies her husband dies for whatever reason and now she's a single woman and she starts to go out and she starts to you know really live it up and stuff like that you know because her husband I guess had money and now she's got money you know she's living in pleasure you know and she goes out and she's making all kinds of trouble and uh, that's not right it's not the way it's supposed to be and what will happen is, when a woman gets like that, she'll actually basically receive damnation to herself in this life. She's saved, on her way to heaven, but in this life, she's going to make a mess of her life and of other people, unless you stop her. So that's why you don't take a widow like that into the number. All right? 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13. Here's what happens when you don't stop a woman like this. And with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 10 through 12 says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, walk, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them which are... Or now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 5 through 6. Okay. It says here, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins led away with divers lusts. Now, of course, that can go two ways. Number one, you could have a single woman, a widow there, and she's in her home, and she starts to listen to the wrong kind of prosperity preachers and stuff like that because she's got money and she doesn't want to give it up, you know, and all that, and it messes her up. It can also go, you know, the, the thing of a false prophet coming into a house and leading captive silly women. That can also go to a married woman who doesn't have anything to do with her time. Uh, the worst possible thing that you can do for your wife, by the way, husbands, is to make her life so easy that she doesn't have anything to do. If you're a good husband, you will encourage your wife to work around the house. Not because she's your slave, not because, you know, she's a slave to the home or anything like that. No, no, not at all. You will encourage her to work with her hands. You will say, hey, honey, could you cook that? Hey, could you wash that? Hey, could you clean this? And when you're done... What kind of crafts would you like to get into? You know, here, let me buy you some yarn. Let me buy you some crochet hooks, some, some knitting needles, some whatever. And when she makes a project, you say, hey, honey, that's really beautiful. That's wonderful. That's great. Okay, watch the Proverbs 31 man sermon uh, that I put up. and I talk about that. I talk about a lot of that stuff there. Um, the best thing for a woman is for her to stay busy. You know why Eve fell? Because she wasn't busy. She was out there wandering around through the garden, you know, of Eden, and Satan came up and went, Hey, hi, Eve. And Satan's ministers, appears the ministers of righteousness, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 11, I think it is. Yeah. And they appear as the ministers of righteousness. Guess what? They're going to do the same thing Satan did. They're going to go after the wife. Because if they can get the wife, if they can mess up the wife in the home, then they can mess up the rest of the house. Work the wife over, she'll mess up the husband. Well, she'll mess up the children many times first, and then mess up the husband. Okay? Very important there. And of course, you have a busybody there that the Bible warned about. You know, and they, she becomes a tattler. You know, what's a tattler? That's somebody who spreads gossip. 
Very interesting here. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 8 says, The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Did you ever tell something about somebody that you shouldn't have told, and the Lord convicts you, and it feels like you've been wounded in the stomach? You feel like, I shouldn't have said that. And you actually, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have said that that was gossip. I shouldn't have done that. That's what gossip, that's the way gossip should make a spirit-filled Christian feel. You shouldn't feel good when you spread gossip about another believer, another brother or sister in Christ. If you hear something, some, somebody comes to you and, and in confidence they say to you, I'm really having a hard time, I'm thinking about leaving my wife or something like that. You don't go, oh, okay, I'll pray for you. And, and then, oh, you aren't going to believe what I've heard. Oh, i got to get this to you. You aren't going to believe this. You are not going to believe. Don't be a talebearer. Don't be a gossip. That's a sin. And Proverbs 18, verse 8 says that it's as a wound. Okay? The words of a talebearer tail are as wounds. Alright? It's a bad thing. Negative reference. Unless you're using a new version. The NIV says the words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the innermost parts, or the inmost parts, of the, uh, inmost parts. I'm reading the one below it. Inmost parts. Choice morsels. How about the English Standard Version? The words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the innermost or inner parts of the body. Delicious morsels. No, the, the word is wounds. New King James Version. I love this one. The words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles. And they go down into the inmost body. Footnote. Go down to the footnote. Proverbs 18, verse 8. Uh, it says here, a Jewish tradition reads wounds. So it's just a Jewish tradition there. No, it's the Word of God says wounds. That's the right word there. Um, if I told you... Um, I have two options for you today. Number one, you can have a wound or you can have a delicious morsel or a tasty trifle. Which one do you want? Nobody would say, I'll take the wound. Ooh, 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 give me a wound. Ooh, I want a wound. See, you wouldn't do that. You'd say, give me the delicious morsel. What is it? Oh man, I'm anxious for that. See, totally different spirit behind these new versions. Totally different. But look here at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14. We'll continue. Okay, what do you do with a, with a young woman? Okay, what do you do? I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. Now, maybe I read that wrong. I'll look at it here again. I didn't, I didn't see the word career in there. Uh, it's, it's bound to be in verse 14 because, you know, I mean, if you're a, a young woman, you've got to have a career and make as much or more if, as your husband. It's not in there. You know why? Because the Lord never designed it for women to be out there in the workforce. You say, well, well women are in the workforce, though, Brother Brian. I know that. But it's the same thing as older Christians are in nursing homes. You see, we've gotten away from the Bible in our culture. And if you want to hear the actual reason why that thing came in, you can listen to my sermon, The Sin of Feminism, where there's an interview with Aaron Russo, who was a Hollywood movie producer, and he actually knew one of the Rockefellers, I think it was, uh, might have been Nelson Rockefeller, and this Rockefeller guy said that the reason we brought in, he said they, that the Rockefeller Foundation actually funded the feminist movement for two reasons. Actually, I'm sorry, for three reasons. Number one, create more taxable income. If you just have all the men out there working, well, that's only, you know, 50% of the people. You get the man and the wife, now you got more taxable income. Second reason, break up the family. Yeah. Oh, honey, I'm sorry, I got to go to work. And the wife goes off to work. And the husband's off to work. What's that do for the child? Number three, get the children into the public school brainwashing system. Hello. Uh, I went through it. I went to public school. 12 years plus kindergarten. You know, 13. Number of cursing in the Bible. Interesting. 
But, uh, you know, what's going on? Well, the devil had a great plan. And if you go back into the early 1900s and 1800s, women were keepers at home. They wouldn't have been out there working out in the workforce. You say, well, I saw pictures of general stores and the women were there. Yeah, right beside their husband working. See, a family-operated business that runs from the home and things where the wife is right there with the husband. Well, okay, I can see that. But when you have the wife out working at some place and she's away from her husband and she's working with male co-workers, oh boy. You say, well, Brian, I don't agree with you. This is sexist. This is ridiculous. This is old time, you know, old time stuff. You know, there's, there's no proof that this is wrong. Okay, uh, I guess the fact that divorce rates are like 50% among professing Christians, that has nothing to do with this, right? Because mm -hmm. the wife goes out and she's saying, well, I make enough money, I can do this stuff on my own. I don't need my husband. And hey, that guy down there at, at, uh, at my job, you know, we have good conversations. I could, I could run off with that guy. I mean, he's interested in me. My husband doesn't even pay me attention, any attention, you know. See, it's, it's just the whole system is bad, okay. And what happens is a woman, a young woman, says, I'm not going to get married. I'm not going to seek the Lord's will for a husband. I'm not going to be busy at home. I'm not going to be a busy keeper at home. I'm going to go out into the workforce. And what happens? She's turned aside after Satan. I can prove it. I can prove it. Thousands upon thousands and thousands of cases of women going out into the workforce and they get messed up time and time again. And children that go off to public school when they should be at home being homeschooled and they go off to public school and, you know, they get messed up. They start to deny the, the teachings of the Bible and they start to hate God and everything else. It's a bad situation, very bad situation. And, you know, you say, well, brother, we have to have two incomes. Do you? Yeah, we have one income. And it's not that much money either. You know, if you think I'm getting rich, you know, being in ministry, you, <laughs> you're kidding yourself. Okay. I'm not getting rich. You know, I thank the Lord for, for uh, the support of God's people. And I thank the Lord for the money that we do make. But uh, there are times we were eating celery and carrots. You know, carrots and celery for, for meals. Okay. Um, times we were eating potatoes for a couple meals. Uh, weeks where we went without any meat at all. Uh, and you say, oh, that's such a shame. No, uh, yeah, you know, it might be to some people, but, you know, that's how we made it. You sacrifice. I drive a 1994 Ford pickup truck that I've owned for many years. It's got a big dent in the back side. It's got all kinds of rust problems and stuff. Runs great, you know. Oh, well, you brother, you got to have a new vehicle. It might let you sit someplace. Well, it might, but then again, the Lord might Keep it running, like he's been doing for years now. You say, what kind of vehicle does your wife drive? Um, she sits in the passenger seat. What do you do when she has to go food shopping? I go with her. Brethren, there are ways that you can save money. There are ways that you can cut corners and do things so that your wife can be a keeper at home. You say, brother, we got all kinds of debt. Then get out of it. Get out of your death pledge, mortgage, you know. Do what you can. There are lots of things. I'm telling you right now, that's why we are doing what we're doing, buying land. You know, if I told people, if I was standing here beside a, a cliff and I said, hey, come on up here, jump off. That water's real nice down there. It's plenty deep. You can get in there. People say, uh, did you ever jump off this and go down into that water? And I'd say, oh, no. But, I, you know, I recommend it. Well, I'd make me a hypocrite, wouldn't it? Well, what I'm trying to do, what we're trying to do, my wife and I, with the thing of debt-free living, we'd be hypocrites if we said you can live debt-free, but yet we aren't living debt-free. So we've been working very, very hard to pay off any debts that we have. And now the Lord, if you've seen last week's video, the Lord has provided us with a property because God's people have been praying for us and the Lord has provided us a place. And it's very, very, very low cost. Very low cost. Uh, we're trying to live as cheap as we can. Why? So that we can show other Christians how to do it. Other Christians, it is possible to live in this world today without being in debt to a bank someplace. See? That's why we're doing what we're doing. 
yeah, it'd be easy to just go and get a mortgage and go and get some big house someplace and try to make the payments every month and all that other stuff. That'd be easy. We could do that, but we don't want to do it that way. We want to try and forge a way and say, okay, here's how it works for us. And I can tell you right now, if you are thinking you need two incomes to survive, I don't agree with that. And you say, well, brother, that's just the facts. That's the way it has to be right now. Then God's wrong. Then the word of God is not correct. You say, well, that was for back then. This is for now. Uh, wrong. I know that Christians get themselves into a mess a lot of times, and I'm not, I'm not trying to really come down on any of you and really slam you and put a big guilt trip on you and stuff like that. I'm not trying to do that, brethren. I know that I know there are hard things and, and tough stuff that, that my brothers and sisters in Christ are going through. But, you know, when you try to live by God's Word and you say, you know what, the Bible says it, that's the way I'm going to live, God will help you with that. Don't think that you're going to get to a point where you're just going to say, God's just going to like, lead you through the Bible and then just totally drop you. It's not going to happen. God will lead you and direct you if you will let Him and if you will submit to His Word. And you can live on one income. And you can live debt free. And if you're a woman, you can be a keeper at home. There again, one of the things of being busy with your hands, if you're a woman, so Satan doesn't come in and start messing with you, one of the best ways to stay busy is to work on things in the home that can save the family money. Instead of going to the store and buying everything, try making things yourself. Instead of having to have the best of everything and have two cars, two cars are expensive. Two insurance payments, two gas bills, two repair bills, two, I mean, cut it down to one vehicle. You know, make sacrifices. You can do it. Get rid of the cell phone, monthly expenditure that you don't need. Get rid of the cable TV. I mean, you shouldn't have that anyhow. You know, get rid of a lot of that stuff. Get things whittled down to you're spending very, very, very little. You can do it. You say, well, uh, you know, we'll talk about it tonight when we go out to eat. <laughs> uh, there, there you go again. Um, don't go out to eat. You can do a lot of things to save yourself money. Enough of a rant on that. Some of you probably shut that off anyhow, but, you know, we'll continue. Verse 16, First Timothy 5, 16. If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. Okay? So what's being said here is this thing of taking a woman, a widow, into the assembly there, into the church, to take care of her if she's three score years old or older. Um, if she has family then you don't say, well, it's the whole church's uh, responsibility. No, it's your responsibility. That's the way it should be. And you should, you know, you say, well, Brian, you know, you said the nursing homes and all that. Yeah, I know, I know. But if there's a way that you can take that widow into your own home and take care of them, do that. Okay? Again, the Bible says to do it. The Lord will help you. Don't think for a minute that, that God's Word is, is no longer good for today. If you do it by God's Word, He'll help you get through it. Oh, but it's going to be difficult. Yes, doing things the right way is difficult. All right, verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the Word and doctrine. Okay, now what's the double honor there? Well, first of all, you have respect. Getting back to the thing of respecting the elderly. You got a man who's an elder, you don't go up to him and act like a little punk to the guy. All right? Understand that, you know, a lot of times people come to me and they say, well, you didn't cover this or you didn't cover that. Well, yeah, I know that. I can't cover every single point in a sermon. You know, don't come to me and act like I'm stupid or something because I didn't cover the point that you thought up in your mind. All right? When people come to me in, in humility and say, hey, in a respectful way, Brother Brian, I know you said this, but doesn't the Bible teach this? You know, and a lot of times I've responded back and I say, yeah, it does. Actually, you're right. I should have made a mention of that. Thank you for bringing that up. I try to have humility with that. Now, you, you know, you get somebody that has a little pet doctrine that I don't agree with and they bring it to me and they say, you have to submit to what I believe the Bible teaches. And I say, no, I'm not going to do that because you're wrong. You know, I don't believe you're right. And then they go away in a huff of, he's not correctable. Well, if I'm not wrong, then yeah, you're not going to change me, you know, if I don't 
see your case for it. You know, and I get some people and they're like, you know, I want to carry out a long email debate with you. You know, I, get some, I got this guy here recently wrote me and he was my video I did about, against Steven Anderson where I said about 10 questions that Steven Anderson can't answer. And this guy answered, you know, in his mind anyhow, he answered my 10 questions and then he said, write back, I want to have a formal debate with you and post all this stuff online. I'm not going to waste my time on that. Why? Because I can't take the time, if I take all my time answering all these other people out there, I'm never going to come out with new information. I'm never going to be coming out and doing the job that the Lord's called me to do. The Lord did not call me to be a professional debater. That's not my calling. My calling is to teach the Word of God. So I'm going to focus on that. And if I see, hey, somebody just has a quick little, hey, Brother Brian, I know you said this, but the Bible says that. How do you explain this? I'll answer that. It might take me a little while to get back to you, but I'll answer it. But you get these people that say, I want to carry out this long, it's going to take multiple emails. I don't have time. I just don't have time. If you can't respect me enough to condense that thing down and get it to me, you know, well, then you're just trying to waste my time. You know, especially if I've already answered your questions and you come back, yeah, but what about this and what about that and what about, you know, you know, whatever. I mean, hey, if, if you get so convinced that I'm a false prophet and whatever else, start up your own channel, make your own videos, spend, you know, start up a ministry exposing Brian Denlinger. I'm sure the Lord will bless that, you know, uh, whatever, okay? But uh, what's the other honor there? Double honor. First you have respect. Then you have what? Income. That's the other part of double honor there. Respect them, but also make sure that that guy's supported. Okay? You say, how do you know that? Well, continue to first, verse 18. 1 Timothy 5, verse 18. For the scripture saith, saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Now, if you notice there in verse 17, it said about especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Um, you say, who should I support, Brother Brian? Who's, who would be a good ministry to support? Well, look for a man who believes the King James Bible and labors in the word and doctrine. If some guy's standing up and just giving you these little automated, you know, you can tell he didn't spend any time at all putting the thing together and, he's, and he really doesn't know what he's talking about and whatever else some little hireling in a church building someplace, yeah, I wouldn't really waste much money on somebody like that. But there are good ministries out there, local church Bible publishers. I mean, they local church Bible publishers, they put out King James Bibles for just over what it costs them to make them. They make very little money there. I've always recommended you give money to somebody who's going to pu publish the Word of God, somebody who is, who is actively engaged in printing this book. You know, that's who you should give your money to. Give your money to people who are putting out the word, laboring in the word and doctrine. You know, you, you see a preacher and you say, you know, uh, he's really spent a lot of time studying the Bible. He's really putting together some really interesting messages, really answering a lot of people's questions. Support the guy. Honor him with your respect. Honor him with your support. You say, well, Brian, it sounds like you're trying to get our support. Well, if you want to, fine. If not, go someplace else. It's just as simple as that. I am not going to beg for money. You know, that's not of the Lord. I'm not going to beg. If somebody wants to support King James Video Ministries, okay, thank you. We appreciate it. All those that do support us, thank you. Uh, God will bless you for that. Uh, if you don't want to support us, support somebody else. But don't go home to heaven as a little tight wad that says, I'm never going to give a cent to anybody. Uh, you don't want to do that. Make sure you're tithing, make sure you're, you know, I shouldn't say tithing. Make sure that you are giving to somebody, okay? Um, if you want more information on that, you can hear our sermons on paid ministry. What about paid ministry? And the other sermon, um, uh, does King James Video Ministries require a 10% tithe? Okay, watch those two sermons. Right, and you will see what the Bible actually has to say about the thing of tithing. So, continuing. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 19. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Okay, so in other words, a man who is there and you are honoring him and respecting him because he labors in the word and doctrine, don't receive an accusation against that guy unless there's two or three people 
that have seen and heard what's going on there. Okay, and this thing of two or three witnesses, very important. Deuteronomy 17, verse 6 says, At the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. Now that's actually a good system of law. You get somebody, it's their word against another, well, you can't really condemn them because, you know, there are no other witnesses. It's just this guy, what this guy says against this guy. This guy says he's guilty, this guy says he's innocent. You know, it doesn't work. But if you get two or three witnesses, ah, now you have something. Deuteronomy 19, verse 15 says, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, and any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. Right? Matthew 18, verse 16 says, But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that, it, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. So Jesus actually shows this law back there in Deuteronomy, and he says this is the way it's supposed to be. If you have a problem with somebody, then you are to take one other, which would be two, or two other, which would be three, you know, including yourself, and go to that person. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 says, This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So it's in the Old Testament. Jesus confirms it in the New Testament. You know, they're under the law yet before the crucifixion, Matthew 18. And Paul confirms it after, you know, Jesus died on the cross and rose again. And 1 Timothy 5, 19 is the next one. And then Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28, says, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So even after the church age has ended, into the time of Jacob's trouble, it's still there. It's a standard, right, that should not be changed. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 20. Them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. Who's the them? Elders. And it says, uh, them that uh, teach a doctrine I don't agree with, you rebuke before all. Is that what it says? No. It says, them that sin. Them that sin. Not them that I disagree with. Them that have another interpretation of Scripture than mine. You don't rebuke elders like that. You don't say, I, you, know, you don't agree with me and I don't agree with you, so I'm going to rebuke you and I'm going to make videos against you and stuff. You know, um... If you ever see me out in public and you see me with a woman that's not my wife or something like that, you know, and you have another brother or two that's, that's there and, you, and they all see the same thing, or they see me staggering out of a bar drunk and hobbling over to my truck and getting in, well, rebuke me before all. You know, come to me first and say, hey, brother, we saw you drunk. And I'd say, oh, get out of my face, you know. Then you rebuke me. <sighs> Stink bugs. Sorry, I'm getting kind of distracted here, but... Um, anyhow, you know, it's sin that you're rebuking elder over, not disagreements over doctrine. That's important to get. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 21. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Boy, that one's disobeyed in many congregations, there's a lot of partiality among some of the brethren out there. But what's the Bible standard? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to see the thing here about how you should judge among the brethren. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Okay, it says here, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust, and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge, now look at this, who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. Hmm. So it says there, you are supposed to pick those who are least esteemed in the church to judge matters. Now how often does that happen in a congregation? 
usually the people who judge things, who make the decisions, are the ones who tithe the most, or the ones who have the biggest mouth. You know, you don't often see somebody going over, you know, to an elderly couple sitting there in, in the back and stuff and saying, hey, what do you folks think? Brother, sister, what do you, what do you think about this? No, it's the leadership, you know, the one-man pastor that sits up there from his dictatorial position of power, and he makes the decisions and rules from the chair. I mean, a uh, pulpit, you know, in his 501c3 corporation. He puts people in their place and whatever else. It's not how it's supposed to be. You know, you are not supposed to uh, do things by partiality. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22. You can go back there. Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Now here's something again that I've been guilty of. You say, what are you talking about? Well, I've laid hands on other men's ministries. You know, I endorse this guy here. I say, hey, he's another good Bible believer. And then a bunch of Christians write me and they're like, hey, brother, do you know that uh, so-and-so believes this or believes that? And I go, are you serious? Send me the video. They send me the video. Oh, brother, he does. You know, a good example would be Mike Hoggard. Uh, Michael Hoggard is a, a man that I believe is saved, but he's very, very proud. <laughs> and he does not believe in eternal security. He does. He says he does, but he doesn't. And he does, you know, yes, I do, but I don't. And all this other stuff. He's very confused, and he's too prideful to be corrected. And it's unfortunate, because I endorsed the man's ministry. I said, if you're newly saved, listen to Mike Hoggard. And then I find out Mike Hoggard does not believe in eternal security. He's non-dispensational. He's starting to go post-trib. And I'm going, oh, great. You know, What did I do? I laid hands suddenly on Mike Hoggard. And guess what happened? I was a partaker of his sins, of the errors that he's in. I partook of those things. And so then I didn't keep myself pure. Now people are going, wait a second. Brian says that there's eternal security, but yet he endorses Mike Hoggard. What's going on? You know, see, problem. And, you know, I wish I could endorse more men out there, but I just don't have time to sit down and watch everybody's sermons. I mean, uh, there's a couple good channels on YouTube. I mean, uh, you know, there's a few, but I can't name that many of them because there's some that, you know, they're not just off in a little doctrine or something or a little area where we disagree. Um, it's major, major doctrine. And if I send people there, they start getting messed up. You know, I can't endorse people. It's a shame. Okay? Now next we're going to go to the alcoholic's favorite memory verse. The modern day alcoholic. Look at verse 23. Drink no longer water, excuse me, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Okay? Um... So then it's okay to drink wine. Yes, actually it is. But notice Paul does not say lots of wine to the point where you're getting drunk. He says a little wine. For what? To forget your misery? To get out there and get plastered and, and stumble around and have a good time be the life of the party? Uh-uh. For thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. For medicinal reasons. Okay, um, there's a, a sense there, and, and I don't know all the science behind this, but there are types of wine, and the wine that the Jews would make was not nearly what, you know, like a lot of the alcohol, uh, alcoholic wine is. It's not as strong and things. But fermented foods and fruits and things, vegetables, oftentimes contain probiotics, and they're actually very, very good for your stomach. I'll give you a little example. Um, my wife and I here recently just uh, finally completed our, our time of fermentation. Uh, we made our own sauerkraut. And what you do is, it's very simple. All you do is you take a, a crock. We actually bought a, a, a German crock. We found it on eBay. And uh, you take the thing and you take cabbage and you slice it into real thin little strips. Then you put the cabbage in, you put a little bit of salt on it. And you put more cabbage, a little bit of salt, you know, keep doing that. And you put something on it to weigh it down, to kind of smash it down. And then you just let it sit like that in a cool, dark room. You don't put it in a refrigerator or in the freezer or something. You just put it in a dark place. 
and then it ferments. And it'll get moldy on top and everything, you scrape that off, and it turns into sauerkraut. A lot of people go, eh, sauerkraut's disgusting. Well, actually not really. Uh, when you make it yourself, it turns out very good. And um, it has probiotics in it, and it's actually good for your stomach. Quick little story, uh, my older sister, uh, she lives on a farm, and she knows an older man. And this older man, the one time she was there, and she was you know, near this guy and everything, and she started getting sick. And her stomach, stomach, she was had a stomach ache, and she was just kind of feeling bad and just, oh, uh, you know, really starting to feel bad. And this older guy said to her, he said, do you have any sauerkraut? And she was like, yeah. And he said, uh, homemade, you know, sauerkraut? And she, yeah. And she said, uh, or he, he said to her, he said, uh, go get a spoon and get some of that liquid and drink that sauerkraut liquid. And she was like, oh, you know, she, was, she said she almost threw up just at the thought of that. She was like, you want me to drink sauerkraut liquid, sauerkraut juice, when I'm feeling sick? Are you nuts? And he said, do it. So she went and she got the sauerkraut juice and she drank it. And about an hour or so later, he said to her, he said, hey, how you feeling? She's like, fine, what do you mean? And he said, uh, you were feeling sick earlier. Yeah, I was. What was going on there? Well, the fermented cabbage had probiotics which are like antibiotics somewhat, you know, and they get into the stomach and they get rid of, you know, infections and things like that. And they actually can make you feel better. So you get somebody who is starting to be sick and they are drinking a lot of water. Well, your stomach says, I need something a little bit different than just flushing the system here. I need some, some kind of a fermented thing here. And so you take some fermented grape juice, wine, and you drink that. It's the same thing. It's doing the same thing as sauerkraut would do, or as other fermented types of vegetables or fruits. You are, and I don't mean if you see a rotten fruit in the garbage, you go over and drink the juice or something. I, I'm not talking about that. There's a, there's a certain process there, you know. Um, but th the whole point is, it's a medicinal thing. This is not giving grounds for going out and getting drunk. It's a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. And that stuff is still, that, that science, that true science is still there for today. Okay, you can still drink fermented types of liquids that are done appropriately and it can actually help you feel better. Very interesting. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 24 through 25. Last two verses. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that are otherwise cannot be hid. A drunkard who tries to justify himself by using 1 Timothy 5 verse 23 will only show the world his own folly when the alcohol in his life causes him to have health and financial trouble. Very true. Okay? Those sins are open beforehand, going before the judgment. Okay? That's what's going on there. You know, some guy tries to say, well, it's okay for me to drink alcohol. I can get drunk once in a while. It's not a big deal. I won't go to hell. Okay, your sin will be open beforehand. And it's going to go before the judgment. God's going to judge you in, up there, but also in this life. And you're, you're going to find that you're going to get sick and you're going to have all kinds of trouble. If you tarry long at the wine, you know, like it says back in Proverbs, talks about back there, you're going to have problems. You're going to have a bunch of problems. Okay? But notice it says there, and some men they follow after. Interesting too, because another favorite technique of the sinner will be they will find a good godly man that did the sin that they want to do. And they say, see, he did it and he got away with it, so I can do it too. Uh, don't follow after men in that way. It's a bad idea. Okay, if the Bible condemns something, then it's the Bible needs to be your standard, not what other people are doing. Okay, and then it says, likewise also the good works of some are manifest beforehand. All right, a true Christian will, who avoids alcohol says, I just, you know, I don't even really need to go there. You know, if I get sick, well, okay, maybe then I'll take some fermented wine, you know, for my stomach's sake. But they say, for the most part, I'm just avoiding it. And definitely drunkenness, I'm going to avoid that. They'll have a good life and they'll show no hypocrisy in their profession. Okay, and there's a lot of other sins too that could fall into this category. Whereas a Christian, you should avoid certain things. And, you know, 
that those good works that you do will be manifest to other people. You'll live a good, clean life. Okay? But it says there, in the last part of verse 25, they that are otherwise cannot be hid. Those Christians that are basically fake, and they start messing around with sin, you know, but when they come to church, you know, they're living a totally different life, you know. Before long, that sin is not going to be hid anymore. Just like the pastor that I mentioned in one of these studies there that uh, was a Ph.D. and pastor of the first Baptist church I went to after I got saved, Cornerstone Baptist Church. And the sins that he had in his life that he wasn't taking care of, those sins couldn't be hid after a while. They came out. The truth came out. And I can guarantee you, if you are messing around in sin, if you're messing around with drunkenness, you got that bottle of whiskey hidden back someplace where nobody knows, you know, and you get on the internet and you look at pornography, uh, be sure your sins will find you out. You will not get away with that forever. If you sow to the flesh, you will to the flesh reap corruption. That's why you're supposed to have a good conscience before God, a good thought life. I'll tell you what, brethren, that is scary stuff. Because I know a lot of people don't have good thought lives. For years and years and years, I didn't have a good thought life. It took work, lots and lots of work, to get away from that whole, uh, the sins that I was messing around with. And if you're messing around with sin, it will come out eventually. You will make shipwreck of your life. So get those sins confessed, get them forsaken, and serve the Lord Jesus Christ with the life that you have. So that's going to be it for 1 Timothy chapter 5. Let's close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the challenge from your word. And Lord, it's so easy as Christians to want to base our truth on the standards of society. It's so easy, Lord, to, to just say, well, other people have nursing homes and other people don't take care of widows. And, and for the women out there, they say other women have jobs, other women have careers. Um, but Lord, that's not the standard. The standard is your word. And if your word says something, Lord, then, I, then we should be doing it. I should be doing it. And um, Lord, I just pray that, that uh, if there are Christians out there that are not in line with these scriptures, that they would do what they can, Lord. I know things are very challenging right now. I know that there's a lot of problems and things. But Lord, I pray that, that Christians would, would feel convicted enough to want to live by your word and live by the standards of your word, Lord, because that is the only way we can find true happiness and true joy in this life. The only way that you can truly bless us is if, is if we live according to your word. It's not easy, Lord, but I, I thank you, Lord, for putting me on that right path just in the last two years, really. Getting on the right path with health and things like that. I, I thank you, Lord, for that and for the blessings that you have given us. And Lord, I just uh, pray for all those out there that they would Stay true to your word. And um, if there's a woman out there that's listening, that she would stay busy and uh, not allow the devil to get in and start messing with her. And if she's having thoughts about turning against her husband, Lord, I pray that she would repent of that and get away from that. And uh, for the husbands out there, Lord, I pray that they would protect their wives and give their wives things to do in the home and encourage them to to be the keeper at home that they're called to be by your word. And I just uh, pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That would be the end of 1 Timothy chapter 5. Next week we're going to do 1 Timothy chapter 6. Uh, of course, I'm recording these sermons back to back because there's going to be a lot of work that we need to do where we're going to be traveling a lot and things. So... Uh, you know, please keep us in your prayers as we, we do have property now. And like I said, thank you for everybody out there praying. But now we have the added thing of, okay, now we got to actually get there. We're going to be doing closing here. Um, in fact, we're probably, you know, by the time this sermon is aired, it's probably going to be done, the, all the paperwork, Lord willing. But, uh, uh, just a lot of work, a lot of things to do. So I'm just, uh. Just please pray for us as we continue to do the work here. And and uh, I guess that's going to be it. Thank you for listening. <laughs>